Hi, Mark. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I cannot complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Right Show. You are Mark Schmidt, a sage observer of the Washington scene, and also something or other at New America, Washington Think Tank. What is, what is your title? I, I have two titles, because you can't be anybody in Washington without multiple titles. So I'm a director of the political reform program here, and I also have the title of director of studies. Which studies I don't know exactly. It sounds, it's very it's very serious, but you know, political. Try to, reform. Try to we can use stuff. some political reform. We could, but it's almost so hard to know where to start now. Well, that's what you do the studies for. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <clears throat> so speaking of political reform, that some of us think we might be able to use, let's talk about Donald Trump. Now you were on uh, near the beginning of the Trump administration. Uh, and now I think we should give Trump his 12-week checkup. Okay. I think you've been partly vindicated. As I recall, you said you did not think he would get much of his agenda accomplished. And although it's still early days, it is safe to say that not everything on his wish list has come to pass. He did get a Supreme Court justice uh, right. confirmed. Not nothing. Not nothing at all. No, but... I mean, I did, I did think early on that the legislative agenda would be harder to achieve than everybody assumed. So mm -hmm. the assumption of health care gets repealed instantly, then they do the tax cuts, then they do whatever else. Well, obviously that's, that hasn't come to pass, and I think that was foreseeable. I think getting a Supreme Court justice through was foreseeable also, assuming he didn't go with, like, Andrew Napolitano or somebody completely a complete nutball. I mean, there's a factory where they produce guys like Neil Gorsuch, you know, yeah. <laughs> and they produce them, and Mitch McConnell puts them up there. Where is that factory? Where is that factory? Is it in, in, uh, is it in Washington, the, the actual justice factory? I mean, I think it's kind of spread among the law schools and tied in with the, with the federal that. society and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth, and they're, you know, they have a really clear list and agenda, which, frankly, liberals do, too. It's not like a... Right you know, such a completely nefarious uh, uh, set of activities. But it's like you can you can see the resume, you can see the way people, you can see, you get those, like, endorsements from the liberal law professor who say, I work with him, and he's very reasonable and wonderful, mm -hmm. because that's what life is like in the, or on a, or on a circuit court. And, um, you know, it's the same with Roberts, it's the same with Alito, really. It's really, it's become really hard to make a, a, you know, a case that people can connect with, if people want to have the career that gets them to the Supreme Court, it's not hard to do that. So, mm -hmm. I, so I, you know, yeah, that, yes, that was an accomplishment. It was a Mitch McConnell accomplishment more than anything. I mean, having the, having the opening was not Trump's accomplishment. No, that was certainly <laughs> McConnell's accomplishment. But don't, let's not go there. I'm still a little bitter about that. Yeah, yeah, no, as, as we all should So do. as for health care, I, I think the big question now that you hear murmurs about a do-over is like, was this just poor strategy or is there just a fundamental contradiction within Trump's coalition that basically makes anything impossible? Yeah, I think there's probably a fundamental misconception. I mean, I think the 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 real thing about it is that for seven or eight years they told people this thing is a disaster and we have a better way and they didn't and they knew they didn't and they never actually had to do any of the work well they uh, had you know i think they had what some of, i think they had what some of the uh more ideological conservatives considered a better deal it's just yeah. that it would piss off a whole lot of people who who voted for trump all right, right? i mean you right. can always right. do the the you know the the just take it all away which is right. what some right. of them would like but that's just that's what i mean by the when i say a contradiction within the coalition i mean trump right. more than some past republican presidents got votes from the kind of people who need uh who need help with health care and and and, the, and as much as they think that what they if they get obamacare as much as they may think it's subpar it's way better than nothing yeah, I think that's true. I don't think it's special to Trump voters. I think there were plenty of people who voted for Mitt Romney, mm -hmm. who if Romney had gotten elected, you would have had the same dilemma about getting rid of the Affordable Care Act. I and mean, the only difference would be four years earlier, it was a much less settled deal. I mean, it, it was uh, still a much flimsier part of the, uh, of the, of the health care system, but it would have affected Romney voters just as it affects Trump voters. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we sometimes make this magical 
you know, universe of people called Trump voters who didn't exist. Well, don't before. you think there are appreciably, or are there not more appreciably, uh, uh, are there not appreciably more Trump voters compared to Romney voters who are relatively low income working class whites? Um, I don't think. You don't think. I don't think enough to really be that statistically significant. I mean, he didn't, you know, Trump didn't actually get that many more votes than Romney did. Okay, so we're just, well, yeah, but he's president. And, uh, I'm not, I, obviously, not. for that purpose, it doesn't <laughs> but, affect things. But, it, but, to, but to treat it as if there's a magical universe that wasn't there for Romney that right. appeared that's more low income, um, there, are, there are counties where that's true, yeah. but not, you know, okay. as, a, as a universal rule. I think, you know, it's a... Uh, Republican voters have always been simultaneously hostile to anything that had to do with Obama, hostile to anything that had to do with government, mm -hmm. and yet, in all kinds of ways, I mean, for one thing, they're older, and the older you are, the more you are dependent on some services. That's just in the nature. It's easy to be a 22-year-old yeah. libertarian, you know? Yeah. Um, so basically, you think the deal is just what some people said at the very outset of Obamacare is like, look, once you give the American people some benefits, it's very hard to take them away. Uh, yes, that's right. That's right. And not even benefits. I mean, it's it's structuring a market. I mean, the, you know, there are two sides of Obamacare. Well, one is Medicaid, which has been, you know, pretty successful and pretty problem free in the states where it's been implemented, and the other is creating a market for individual health insurance, which has always been the problem. I mean, there wasn't, you know, it, it didn't really exist. It was possible in theory, but for many people, not really possible at all to simply buy a health policy as an individual, mm -hmm. which if you could do that, that has a lot of great effects on your ability to start a business or quit your job for something better for, you know, uh, for, uh, for a million reasons. That's a great thing. We just never had that market. So it's not just a benefit. It's creating a market that sort of sort of works because markets have especially markets for something like insurance have to be structured mm -hmm. so you you imagine like nothing at all coming out of any attempt uh, to redo health care legislation i don't really see it i don't see how you go further in the direction of tearing down the essential benefits package um you know like the last thing was make the essential benefits sort of optional to states um, I could see them doing something like that. I mean, what really came out at the end of it was they didn't even have a good definition of what the problem was. They just didn't. You know, in the first fit couple years of the Affordable Care Act, it was all about the mandate. The man any government requiring you to buy a product from a private company was, you know, outrageous infringement on freedom and, you know... Um, what I call it, the easy pass lane on the road to serfdom is a, uh, a phrase I used that I, I thought should have gotten a little more uh, credit. Um, Don't give up. You know, Don't no, I know. You know, so it's just this incredible uh, restriction on our liberty, which I can see. I mean, it's a mandate. It's a, it's a, there was an argument to that. And then after the Supreme Court decision, that kind of got lost, and they really don't talk about it that way anymore. And that's that's probably the strongest, like, literal, you know, Big time case against uh, against the policies of the Affordable Care Act, and then the rest has been, you know, it got very technocratic. Well, the problem with the bill is it's not, you know, it, the 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 market's not working, and some insurers are dropping out, and there's some states where there's only one or two insurers. Well, that's a very practical, but that's not an ideological problem. That's just a very practical problem with the way the the program was constructed. So at that point, w what's your fundamental problem that you're trying to fix by repeal? You know. And I just think they, I, I just, I, I still have not yet heard a really great expression of what the problem is they, they want to solve, other than it's something bad that Obama did, and we've been complaining about it for seven years. You know, not more than complaining about it. We've won three massive elections on the basis of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, do you see signs that there is a learning curve? I mean, at least in the sense of Trump saying, hmm, well, this advisor favored something that blew up in my face, yeah, yeah, yeah. so maybe, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, to, to put a finer point on it, uh, lately, Steve Bannon's stock seems to have been dropping, right. Right. Uh, and the line is that that's because he didn't help handle health care well. I mean, I, I guess that means he was on board with the Ryan plan, and then apparently, further, he antagonized the Freedom Coalition, 
when he, right. he came in and kind of started ordering them around right. or something. And then, you know, and of course the travel ban, which really was, I think, his baby in a more thoroughgoing right. way than healthcare was, did not go well. Not uh, Certainly not the first iteration. Uh, right. So, so I, I mean, I'm getting the sense, and of course you're seeing the ascendancy of Jared Kushner, who, you know, seems to be at a minimum less crazy than Steve Bannon. Uh, and less ideologically fervent. I mean, he wants to be a respected member of some establishment or other. Right. But right there, right. you have what some people call yeah. an improvement. If he wants to fit in with any yeah. establishment, <laughs> he'll be more of a stabilizing force than Steve Bannon, right? So I, I think some people would say, okay, it's been rocky. And, of course, then there's this Syria strike, which I would think is a political success. Although, so far, as we tape this, you haven't seen some big gallop bump. It's only a few days after the strikes. Right, but, right, right. but nonetheless, I mean, that, that, that got bipartisan praise that I think uh, may come back to haunt us. I just don't think Trump is the kind of guy you want to give positive reinforcement to for launching missiles. But, right. uh, but we'll see. Uh, in any event, right now, I would say, I think it's easier to make a case that the administration is on the mend and starting to learn uh, and we'll have a brighter future ahead than it might have been uh, even two weeks ago. I think that's I think that's probably basically true. I mean, it's like you know, I think there was a moment, you know, in in that December January period where you know you'd wake up in the middle of the night and, and it would be like you'd be thinking about people like Bannon and Flynn and Sebastian Gorka, the Hungarian. You know, I think uh, Nazi is the word you're looking Nazi for. Nazi is the word I'm looking for. I use that word carefully. My, you know. Uh, I, I don't use that word lightly, but that's what that guy is, um, and and some of these folks. And, and if you get to the point where you could, you know, it, it, certainly back then, if you'd said, okay, by April there'll be no more Bannon and no more Flynn, that would be a big relief. And and I think it is. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know. It, it occurred to me that I don't know that has Jared Kushner ever like been interviewed on television? Has anyone heard his voice? Has he written anything about his views? I mean, I, I, putting a lot of faith in this completely invisible character uh, seems like a seems like a lot to ask. And I was struck the other day too. Like, there's not. I mean, a lot of things about Bannon were like, well, you know, the president's political strategist shouldn't sit on the National Security Council Principles Committee and things like that, um, which are all true. But it's also like. What kind of political strategist is he actually? I mean, he's not like a, you know, he's not like a Karl Rove or a David Axelrod. I mean, there's these people around the presidency that, you know, have a pretty good feel for demographics and a pretty good feel for public opinion well, and, and their essence, kind of understand and, how it connects with Congress. And, and the you know, essence I, of these guys is that they are not ideological. Right, right, right. Because right, they just right, want to, right. to, to make the president popular, basically. Right. <laughs> Bannon is the opposite. That's right. That's right. That's right. And he... I, I, you know, his greatest, I think, political achievement was somehow he kept Trump a little bit calmed down for the last, like, month and a half of the campaign, yeah. which but, was a well, huge Kelly, achievement. Well, Kellyanne Conway may have played a role. We, That's we, true, too. Maybe yeah, may yeah, a bigger yeah. role. We don't know exactly. <laughs> but uh, it, it seems to me that now Jared and Ivanka are in char are, are, are have that. Right, that mission. Right, right. right, right. Um, but yeah, and, Bannon, and yes, that's not that's better than Bannon. I mean, uh, the idea of somebody like Bannon in the White House is just like so shocking on so many different levels, and just practically how organizations work. Like, if you dropped a guy like Bannon in an ordinary in our office here or whatever, uh, leaving you know, it'd just be a disaster. People like that shouldn't be. A, you know, in yeah. Results. Well, I remember in our last conversation a few months ago, I said, you know, Bannon's a smart guy, and you said, is he? Do you know that? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I will say, I suspect he's, as most of us define smartness, probably smarter than Jared Kushner. Wouldn't surprise me. He's not stupid. He's just so kind of, uh, you know, ideologically eccentric and intense that he does things that are impolitic. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I don't mean he's a genius. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean the, this weird thing he said after he got got bumped from the uh, you know the National Security Council. The thing about how. Well, we, uh, this the the NSC has been deoperationalized, and this just it was yeah. it was incoherent. It was yeah, gibberish. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. but so he, but 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 he's not a stupid guy. And you're right. As for Kushner, we have no idea. I, I don't. I, right. Come to think of it, I've never heard him open his mouth. Right. Right. 
And, right. and you know, the, the, the Observer, the New York Observer, uh, I think he went through a lot of editors. Uh, yeah. And and I, I just don't know what we have to judge him by, really. Right, right. There is, I think culturally, there's more of an affinity, like... I know people more or less like Jared Kushner, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I know people who went to college with him, you know, and, and I think there's a little more of a cultural affinity um, that maybe gives one a greater confidence, but I think one should also be wary when that's the thing that you're drawing on, you know what I mean, rather than yeah. any other evidence. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I... I mean, there's another source of ambivalence, which is kind of like... Uh, I mean, I don't think I'll ever get to the point where I'm nostalgic about the days of peak Bannon influence, but <laughs> there, there is there is the following, which is that <clears throat> with the Syria thing, he opposed the Syria strikes, and the fact that they're probably a political success will further diminish his stock, although apparently Kushner was, not, was a little skeptical about the strikes as well, so right, maybe we'll call right. that one a draw in the Kushner-Bannon uh, rivalry. For influence, but um, but you know now what you see is with the strikes having happened and gotten bipartisan praise, it seems to me you're seeing the neocons feel their oats and moving toward uh, what they probably hope will be a successful co-opting of the administration's foreign policy, which wouldn't surprise me. You got Nikki Haley talking about regime change in Syria. That's 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 high on the neocon agenda. And so, like, the, you know, forced to choose between a competent uh, pursuit of neocon priorities, a politically competent pursuit of neocon priorities, and such political incompetence that the administration can't get anything done, right. I don't know which way I'd go. I mean, I mean, the latter has its downside, because there's things you would like to be done well, even if you're not a fan of Trump's. Right. Right. But right. it's like, right. it's kind of a can't win situation I mean, or can't lose. Depending. I don't know. You see, you take my point. Yeah, I take your point. I mean, I think, I think there's always an attempt to impose some kind of, you know, theory on Donald Trump's foreign policy in particular. And there isn't a theory. There just isn't. A theory. Not yet. And yeah, I mean, not yet, but well, there not. is, there is no Donald Trump foreign policy. Right. Uh, right. As with that's all right. policies, he's in favor yeah. of whatever will make him popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, but that doesn't mean we couldn't see the coalescence of a coherent foreign policy. I mean, remember these right. mid-level positions at, at state and defense and so on, they haven't been filled out. Right. And I think how they go will say a lot about the possibility of some kind of more or less coherent agenda. Right, right, right. Well, for example, I mean, Tillerson wanted to hire Elliot Abrams. They didn't let him hire Elliot Abrams, partly because Elliot Abrams had said bad things about Trump. Um, but, 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 it was Bannon, they, but it was Bannon reminding Trump of that, and now yeah, with Bannon's yeah, yeah. stock lower, and Abrams writing, uh, you know, he, slobbering all over these yeah, yeah. Uh, missile strikes in praise of Trump, wouldn't shock me oh. if he has a second... That's so, what I was. That's I mean, exactly in any that's event, that's it, to me, from was, my point of view, it's a little alarming that Tillerson wanted Abrams. I, I had thought yeah, that Tillerson... Yeah might have the kind of realism you see with a lot of corporate guys who do international work, yeah, which yeah, is like, yeah. I just, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to bring democracy to the world and change regimes. I just want stability. But look, if he wanted Elliot yeah. Abrams and he knows what Elliot Abrams represents, right, that's, right, I right, was wrong. Right. Well, I think it's an open question whether he actually fully appreciates what Elliot Abrams represents. That I mean, also is a You know, that's a, that, I mean, the, the, it's a... It, it, there are developments that are reduce one's alarm, and there are developments that increase one's alarm. And the reminder that Tillerson seems to be, you know, a really, really empty suit, yeah, is is a dangerous one. I think, uh, you know, not. And I'd be generous to the empty suitness because, like, if you've just done one thing, I mean, you know, Exxon Mobil is a corporation. I mean, I know this from um, from Steve Call's book, our former colleague. Um, you know, it's a very insular corporation. Big corporations like that are just the universe is completely unto themselves. And if you spend your entire career in that bubble, and then all of a sudden you're given this completely, 
you know, an unrelated job for which you have some experience, like you know, you've dealt with companies that have with countries that have large oil and gas reserves that you can try to plunder. Right. <laughs> you know, that's all you've got. Um, you know, it, it's going to be a tough adjustment at you know in your in your mid sixties uh, to to all the demands of these of, of of these incredibly subtle and complicated questions. Yeah, and you know. Exxon isn't like a lot of companies. I mean, like Silicon Valley companies, the CEOs are almost invariably very socially proactive. They yeah, talk to yeah. they talk to media personally. Yeah, They're yeah. out there. Their profiles are part of the company's profile. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. with Exxon, you figure, look, we're going to get mainly bad press. <laughs> and, you know, not necessarily because they're bad, but because they figure, look, the, lib the media is liberal. Everyone's concerned about global warming. Let's put out some pre some some press releases about how we worry about global warming too, and that's the best we can do. Right. There's no point in the CEO cultivating them. So he is, as far as public interaction, has he's lived in a shell. Yeah, totally. And totally. And, and, and uh, I had thought I would that never, I would never know the name. You know, if you ask me yeah. who's the CEO of, of Exxon Mobil, other than the fact that I I read Steve's book, I would have no ability to name that person. Right. So you don't now. I might have thought that just traveling the world. God knows Exxon has some foreign right. properties. I might have thought that that traveling the world and talking to foreign leaders would itself have given him more more of a cosmopolitan air than he seems to actually have. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, so there's that. Um, what about so anyway? You're what do you do you do you see tea leaves involving the further evolution of the actual advisory structure, personnel-wise. Like, there were stories very recent that, each reason that Bannon is on his way out, out, out. <clears throat> um, it seems to me... Well, what's your take on that? On why Bannon is out? Well, no, I mean... Yeah. He's not out of the administration. Or why... why he could he be, be out of the... There, there have been stories that he could be out of the entire administration. Right. Right. Which might be self-imposed, and as in his... You know, he's knocked down a peg and he says, you know, screw it, I'm out of here. Yeah, uh, but there were also these these anonymous sources in, uh, high in the administration saying that he might get booted soon. Yeah, yeah. So those are two. Supposedly he is threatened to quit and right, right. so on. What's your, right. what's your, do you take any of this seriously? Uh, I mean, at, at some point there's so much different leaking, every, you know, that, that you, you, you have to triangulate among the different stories. Like it's as much... You know, you read any of these stories. I mean, one of them had twenty sources. The or name claimed twenty. They always sources. do this. The Times yeah, and the Post yeah, yeah, say yeah. the following story is based yeah. on conversations with twenty. I don't even think this yeah. administration has twenty. I, I know, I know. Like that is a lot of. <laughs> they people. haven't hired twenty people yet. <laughs> right. Well, it's also sort of like the old, you know, the 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 Watergate, the Washington Post rule in Watergate, which was everything had to have two sources. Right. But like the two sources, source two could have learned it from source one. You know, right. it's not always. Necessarily, two completely different, right. um, different, different sources. Right. But obviously, there's so much going on. I, I wouldn't, you know, any story might be contradicted by another story, and one would be more spin than the other. So we really are, you know, uh, those of us aren't reporters with sources uh, that, you know, we're really kind of guessing at what's true and what's not true between a bunch of things. And I think, I think, you know, yeah, and then kind of predictably blew himself up. Um, and that's no, that's hardly surprising because it's a, kind of a personality and a worldview that doesn't really, you know, all he really had was that faith Trump put in him because of the last few weeks of the election, plus whatever the Mercer's power is over this. Uh, over well, I think that's a big wild card. Yeah. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine if the Mercers continue to back Bannon. And I think, you know, you probably read this uh, New Yorker piece um, by, I guess, Jane Mayer yeah. uh, yeah. on uh, the Mercers. And, you know, of course, the Mercers, you know, billionaire. Uh, they, they, they also uh, own or are invested in the data, data analytics firm that did so much for Trump during the election. They're invested in Breitbart. And the sense right. you got was, first of all, that there was a very fateful interaction among Bannon and the and Mercers and Trump going back further than I had realized. Right. And right. Bannon played a role in, I think, shaping the worldview of 
to some extent, the Mercers, and probably more even Trump, I don't know. But in any event, the Mercers seem to continue to be allies. Uh, in addition to, you know, having sway at Breitbart, they are, were donors to Trump. Now, he, now that you're president, you don't necessarily need any individual donor the way you might have once. Uh, fundraising comes right. a little easier. But, um, but still, it's hard for me to believe that he, you know, if you ask, might he actually fire Steve Bannon? Uh, if the Mercers didn't want it, it's hard for me to believe he would want to antagonize the owners of Breitbart. Uh, I don't know if they're quite majority owners, but I, I think they may even be. I don't know. But 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 clearly, uh, in any, do, do, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think that that assumes that there's a political analysis that he has that says, you know, this crew around Breitbart is this important to me. I'm, I'm going to get to my theory about what happens next to the administration because. You know, I, I don't think there's a, 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 you know, that smart in an analysis. I mean, in one of the stories about Bannon, there was a line that said, you know, Bannon and his allies warn that without the hardcore, you, you know, uh, nationalist base, uh, Trump will be in bigger political trouble or something like that. And I was like, yes, that's absolutely true. You know, I mean, he uh, really, in terms of smart political strategy, he needs to... He needs to appreciate that as those are the people who showed up to the rallies. And once he doesn't have the people at the rallies, he doesn't have very much, you know. Um, those have been his, 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 uh, his, the, the, they've, they've been gratifying to him personally to go to those rallies and fire people up. And they've been, the, you know, more successful than like the inaugural crowd or polling or anything else. So, um, Without that base, I think he's in. I think he's in real trouble. But I don't think he has a theory that's, that that says I need to do this with the base, and then I need to do these other things in order to open up some room to get things done. And I think his theory now is, well, yeah. I mean, I think I think Trump has always wanted, whether it's a Bannon theory or a different theory. I think Trump has always wanted to say, okay. I'm going to go this far with Paul Ryan, and then I'm going to just screw him, and then I'm going to play the Democrats off against him, and then maybe I'll screw them. Because that's how you can operate in a, you know, in a negotiation. You've got some different bidders, and you can sort of play them off against each other, and you can create a, uh, a little game, and you're, and you're happy to humiliate. I mean, the game of domination and humiliation is really what Trump, I mean, that's as important as publicity is, or public approval is to Trump. So he wants to play that game. He doesn't really know how to play that game. So he went a long way with, with Ryan, completely burned up any ability to ever work with Democrats. And I think the next phase, I think the Jared phase, will be Trump saying, I'm going to try to work with Democrats now, and we'll do something about infrastructure. And Jared, go talk to Schumer and, you know, figure this out. Mm -hmm. Not fully understanding that that, you could have done that in December or January, you can't do it now. Why, and is, I that, why be, is that exactly that you can't because, do that? Because, because I don't think there'll be any kind of, I, I, any kind of good faith cooperation after all the nominees are, you know, are so far out there. Democrats were completely cut out of all of that. I think after Gorsuch, I mean, there's, and, 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 and seeing the tides of, of the Russia inv investigation begin to emerge and, uh, and everything, it, it would, it would take a lot for ordinary Democrats to say, yes, I want to collaborate. And the way that the especially, because, especially because clearly, like, you know, the best place to be as a Democrat is, is, is like where Kirsten Gillibrand is, which is pretty far out there in clear-cut opposition. Yeah. There's not that much incentive for, for, you know, for an infrastructure bill that's going to be a bunch of crap anyway. There's really not that much incentive to, to go to that table. Anymore. Well, I think that the ham-handed travel ban was also important here yes, because that, it so that, energized the Democratic that, base and made them that, so unequivocally anti-Trump. That's right. Uh, and, and for very and for very very good reason. Yeah. You know. So, uh, yeah. So you think no hope of uh, working with Democrats, and that cuts his leverage with conservatives. Right. Right, and uh, so you think we we just won't see ultimately yes no uh, ultimately yes well I don't know I mean I think we're, I guess what I would say is I think you will see more phases than you you know all presidencies have phases even if even like short ones like Jimmy Carter even one term presidencies have you know very distinct pieces that you can mark out like eras of who's in control and and how they're navigating and 
um, and, and so forth, I think they'll come more fast and furious in this one, because I think the I think the Jared let's work with Democrats, especially if like Gary Cohn moves up, another person who has no political analysis that we know of, um, but if he if you know if if they boot Priebus and replace him with Cohn, which is the other rumor, uh, then you then I think it's a very natural move to say let's work with Democrats. I think the approval that he got on Syria will make him think like, okay, they like me now, I can work with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, that, I think that that will just be a relatively short-lived phase because that's not going to work. Okay. Uh, yeah, you are, you are hearing that, that maybe Priebus is out too. Um, it's so funny, at the, at, the, at the beginning of the administration, it was all Priebus and Bannon, and is there tension yeah, between yeah, who yeah. will win? And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, the Kushner Ivanka wing swoops in, and, and Bannon and Priebus are almost on the same team. Right. Um, but, but, but it's also a mistake to see this all in policy terms. Like, this is a, this is a guy who is mentally not prepared to be president. He's not prepared for the role he's in. Whether you call it mental illness or not doesn't really matter. He needs a lot of hand-holding, and, you know, he doesn't know who to trust or why because he's not been in this world, so he falls back on family, and he falls back on the people who, you know, can prop him up and have a sense of what he wants to hear and can kind of keep him basically functioning Mm -hmm. in a way that I don't think that, that, that Bannon or Priebus was quite prepared to do. Now you mentioned the uh, the importance of his hanging on to some of his base, the people who showed up <clears throat> at his rallies, uh, and you know, and 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 and, th- and this pointing to one of the perils of his abandoning his nationalism. But don't you think we should distinguish between, like, on the one hand, the alt right kind of activists who read Breitbart and tweet? Which right. are kind of his version of the elite, I guess. That's his elite, and <laughs> yeah, then yeah. and then the you know the 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 the, the truck driver or whatever stereotype you want right. to use right. in Ohio who shows up for the rally, right. and may read may see Breitbart if it shows up in a Facebook feed, but isn't an, an alt right ideologue. And this right. is one reason I wonder how dangerous is it really to throw Bannon to the wolves, right? right? right. But I mean, right. I mean, so you. So you alienate all these guys who have green frog icons on yeah, their yeah, Twitter, yeah. you know, handle. But how how much of a loss is that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. I don't think the people who are coming to the rallies, I don't think they're people who are a are aware of Bannon or care about what happens to Bannon. Let's hope not. Um, and b, I don't think they're people who feel like Syria is a betrayal. I don't think that. I think they're. I think they're right. perfectly exactly. comfortable with like you know. In a way, frankly, I think the, the, the Syria move, as much as anything, it was saying, like, we don't need any allies, we don't need to talk to the UN, we don't need to do a, we don't need to even need to do the basic things that George W. Bush did around the coalition of the willing. We're, we don't even need to do that. We will act, and we will act on our own, and, you know, that's as, that's as, uh, uh, Although, as, wasn't it, as Jacksonian wasn't it, as anything. Wasn't it fairly warmly received. I didn't really do an inventory, but it's not like Europe, you heard a lot of complaints from Europe about this, did you? No, no, no. Uh, but in a way, that's, that's, I mean, it was a pretty, I mean, in the scope of history, it's going to be a pretty, like, that move in itself, lots of things may follow, but like, if nothing follows, what he did last Friday is of is, is kind of trivial. Well, it, it, you know, it, it, it had no real impact on the conflict, for sure, or yeah. Assad's standing. Yeah, it's, um, well, I mean, it may lead him places that will have consequences. Right, right. Like, he's gotten this bipartisan elite affirmation, right. which, you know, a guy in his position must feel pretty good, given the right. way the, the previous uh, 11 all, weeks had gone. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. And so, you know, he may... He may, I think he can, he can, you know, say what you will about his mind. I think he's uh, capable of uh, doing what a rat can do when he presses a bar and gets a food pellet. You launch right. a missile strike, right. they like you. You know, he, right. Trump right. can right. grasp this, this correlation. And right. uh, so, so it could have consequence down the road. But I think, uh, I'm trying to think, how important is it? You know, people have always said, look, by and large, Americans don't care about foreign policy. And, and right. this is certainly true. Now, 
On the other hand, the other another aspect of nationalism, not not uh, you know not the kind of Jacksonian foreign policy, Andrew Jacksonian that is, um, but um, but the economic nationalism. There, this isn't just about the alt right. There, his base per se needs to be persuaded that he's done something that Obama and maybe a regular conservative would not have done. So, like, uh, supposedly, I just read that maybe China is going to uh, throw him a few token concessions or something. Like, that uh -huh. That matters. I mean, he, he has to... I think, look, he's got to... Well, this is a good question. What does he have to do? He's got to start right. building a wall, right? I mean, what he has to do to, to keep his base on the grassroots part of his base. Got to start building a wall. He's got to look as if he's succeeding in the realm of trade negotiation, right? Right. right. Uh, America first. I think you're right on foreign policy. Doesn't matter much uh, as we've tr traditionally construed foreign policy. Doesn't right. matter much to his base. Right. Um, uh, what else? What does he have to do? I mean, infrastructure. Yeah. Right. Doesn't he have to have something to show on infrastructure? I mean, no. I don't. I don't think he has to do anything. And and I don't think he will. I, I don't think he will build much of a wall. I mean, there will be some construction effort that you'll see. They got to dig know, the post holes. There'll be something. There'll be yeah. something. Um, I think on trade, uh, geez, it's hard to imagine just do. It's hard to imagine not actually doing something on NAFTA and claiming much success. Yeah. Um, and on infrastructure, I mean. I mean, often the safest place in politics is to keep talking about a thing without doing it, and that's kind of scary. But, like, imagine if Barack Obama had just, like, kept talking about, we have an obligation to do health care, blah, 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 but hadn't actually, do hadn't actually put himself on the line mm -hmm. and gotten beat up over it, he'd be a lot better off. You know, so I, I, don't, know that vo I don't know that voters, particularly fairly low-information voters, I don't think they're kind of keeping a scorecard of what the promise was and what actually happened. And I don't, th and I think the connection, I mean, certain things have a symbolic, like NAFTA has a symbolic power at this point, mm -hmm. right? I think if you, I think if you, people have, people have very little ability to say, these are the things that have hurt me economically about NAFTA, and these are the things that have, so the same with, I mean, TPP, for example, had that Michael Grunwald in Politico has written a bit about this, TPP had the renegotiations to NAFTA that people would seem to want. Yeah, this is the like trans-Pacific partnership. Trans-Pacific right. partnership that he threw out as another bad deal. Um, so, so it had what that, specifically? You mean it had more in the way of labor and environmental accords? It had or more, uh, I think it, I, I don't remember all the specifics, of, but a lot of the things that would go into renegotiating NAFTA, not, I think, labor and environmental. Yeah, the, the, the funny thing is that that's the, actually the one thing that, in some version of might actually do some good, like labor accords, from the point of view of American workers, I mean. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like if you could impose uh, some kind of floor on other countries in terms of their, well, if not some kind of minimum wage, at least forcing them to allow union to organize, labor to organize and so on, that might actually do some good. But Trump, as long as he's a Republican, uh, that's probably not going to That's that. the original NAFTA fight. That's right. the 90s NAFTA right. fight. Um, well, I think it should still be the progressive aspiration in trade policy. Oh, absolutely, policy. Yeah. absolutely. But that's not the that's not the point of. I, I don't think. That's no, now it's like it, now it's like that. we put up tariffs, you don't. That's right. kind of the uh, right. Trump vi idea of victory. Right, right, right. Exactly. Um, in any event, I mean, I think the the connection between NAFTA and either what people are unhappy about in their economic experience, or what they're or what's positive for them. Uh, is pretty dis disattenuated as it as as makes sense. I mean, like it's not like you can look at your economic life and say this is better because of NAFTA or not or whatever. I mean, you probably have a car that has part, you know, that was the, the you know the integration with Mexico is far tighter. So it's, it's probably hard to know what parts of your car were made in Mexico and what weren't. A lot of them probably were, um, uh, uh, unless you're one of those. Super low footprint people who doesn't even drive. <laughs> I'm not such a person. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, it, it, we're so entangled in it that you know, blowing up NAFTA is 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 a symbolic act, not a literal, you know, economic act that would help a lot of people who voted for him. But I think it's going to be a hard one to to pull yeah. off. 
So you think the most he'll do on trade is get some token things he can he can put in ads, and in any event, you don't think beyond that it especially matters politically. I, I mean, I think I think the thing about the thing about trade and the thing about Trump is it's about affect, right? It's about the affect of like I'm going to stand tough and not shove the you know. And, and and when he's when it actually comes down to it, he's really bad at pulling that off. Yeah. Like he went down there during the campaign and 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 talked to the talked to Nieto and didn't even bring up the wall. Didn't even bring up the thing about paying for the wall. He just kind of says stuff. Uh, but when it's really down to the wire, he has a very hard time actually articulating demands and 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 claiming them. So it's it's much better. I mean, he's, he's great at the game of Atha. And he shouldn't quit the minute you actually try to put that into practice. And that's, that was true on health care, too. Like, you know, affect of, like, I hate Obamacare more than anybody is just affect. Then putting it out into practice is turned out to be where it was impossible. And that's going to be true for a lot of these issues. Yeah, although if, if what you're saying is, hey, he can, he can keep getting by uh, by just saying the right thing and not doing much of anything, well, I think a lot of people would call what he's doing now not getting by. His approval rating is right, around forty percent. Right, right. I mean, that's that's right. not enough, right? He's got to right. he's got to do something. And right. of course, I mean, scarily, one of the most reliable things you can do is uh, instill fear in your population. Um, get get yourself involved in a conflict, whether it's a war or what seems more like a conflict with respect to homegrown terrorism right. or right. whatever. Uh, right. And that's that's the thing that, that, that's arguably the thing that comes most naturally to him. But aside from right. that, uh, it's not that, is it, it sounds, it sounds to me like aside from that, it's not that easy for you to imagine initiatives that he can actually get accomplished that actually give him a major bump in support. That's probably right. I don't. I didn't mean. I don't. I, I. I don't see where that happens right now. I mean, I think they'll be. I mean, it's amazing how shaky they are, even on just the issue of taxes. Oh yeah, Which, I forgot about you know, taxes. I mean, yeah, I want to talk about taxes, and for a second, I want to talk about Jeff Sessions and criminal justice. Okay. Because I mean, I think both of those are fascinating areas. I mean, taxes. It's sort of the same thing as the uh, as the as the Affordable Care Act repeal, or, or like. I'm not here. I know what the problem is that they want to solve, which is just they want their tax rates to be lower, mm -hmm. you know, at the at the high end. But you still have to go in with a theory of like what's wrong with our tax code. It's too complex, or it's or it or it slows down growth, or it does this or does that. I mean, there's lots of ways to come up with ways to say what the problem is in the tax code without, you know, without giving away what your real goal is. And they don't. They're scrambling around for solutions. Each solution solves a different problem, whether it's the, this border-adjusted tax or carbon tax. By or the way, just a, a question some, I've had on my mind is, like, this so-called border adjustment tax is just a tariff, right? And, and doesn't it violate trade, various trade agreements? I, I think it might. I, I You know, I, I there, there's that whole thing of, like, how it, you know, the dollar would, would appreciate to adjust for that. So it, I I feel like it's more I feel like the theory is that it's more complicated than just a tariff, um, and not equivalent to a tariff. It's a it's a it's a you know countries that have VATs have a similar border adjustment. Uh -huh. So therefore, you could do it um, on as a sort of replacement for the corporate tax in the same way. Okay. I, it's a little bit you know. I kind of I'm comfortable with okay, most tax policy. On, then, Once so you, you get into international tax policy, okay. I'm at a loss. Um, so move on. But you know, I mean, my fundamental feeling is like, like that one. The problem it's intended to solve is trade deficit uh -huh. and exports. That you know, is that the problem with the tax code? Is you know, is uh, complexity the problem? Is high rates the problem? You know, I mean, there's not even really an articulation of the of the problem in the tax code, and there's really little appetite for changing the tax. I mean, Americans are, are more satisfied with where they are right now with taxes, mm -hmm. personally, than at any time past. I mean, we're 40 years past the tax revolt now. Mm -hmm. uh, Vanessa Williamson at Brookings has a great new book about uh, what, that people actually take pride in paying taxes and that, that the, the, in a sense, like the shorthand message of the book is 
tax revolt is over. So uh, it's a really hard, you know, it would be good to have an accomplishment in that area, but there's nothing that people are, are, are dying for. And to give a big, um, you know, everybody would love a big middle class tax cut, but the big, you know, middle class tax cuts are more expensive than higher end tax cuts just because there are a lot more of us, you know. Mm -hmm. So they're so they're hard to pull off within any kind of budget constraint. So, yeah, I don't I don't really know what what problem they're trying to solve right now. Okay. Um, so you wanted to talk about uh, sessions. Yeah, I mean, I thought that was. I, I mean, your 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 thoughts about you know instilling fear. You know, there's a very striking story in the Washington Post. Uh, I guess went up yesterday uh, by Sari Horowitz about. You know just how far out Sessions is from this. Um, you know the emerging bipartisan, transpartisan consensus on criminal justice reform, which is a really incredible accomplishment. It's like 20 years in the making. I saw, I knew some of the people who were involved in that. You know, in the late 90s, beginning to forge those relationships with like Chuck Colson's prison ministries and. State so, so we're talking about the mass incarceration problem, the, the largely, mass incarceration and, and the idea problem. that we've just been, we've just put too many people in jail uh, for, yeah, yeah. you know, especially for things like, uh, you know, drug dealing or even just drug yeah. possession, yeah, yeah, yeah. and kept them there for too long. It's had, you know, horrific consequences, uh, especially in the African American community. So, yeah, right. So Sessions is like, no, it's all good, right? Right, right. But but I want to almost talk about it like as an issue of democracy. You know, like yeah. like if you think American politics can function at all, this the, the the emerging consensus to get away from the era of mass incarceration, which involved a lot of conservatives of different stripes. It mm -hmm. involved libertarians. It involved social conservatives, like you know the, those allied with uh, with Colson. It involved. State, state officials who were aware that, you know, prison spent, they, you know, states only have three flows of money, really, which is education and, and, and roads, and then prisons is usually three or four. There aren't that many, you know, they have more, if they didn't get the prison spending under control, they would never be able to get their budgets under control mm -hmm. without making major, uh, uh, major costs in other areas. So there, there are a lot of there are a lot of things came together, and it was a long process, and it was a really, it was a really admirable process with a lot of kind of listening and adjustment, and it wasn't just like Eric Holder said we're going to do this. There was a lot of groundwork, and then Sessions, this other guy's profiled in the in the piece named Cross, who I think is from Kentucky, he's a prosecutor, um, and he's now in the Justice Department. Come in, and and they 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 want to be done with all of that. Which is really, a, which is really astonishing. Yeah. You know, their view is police have been constrained, and we have to unleash the police. They're, you know, uh, the, the the sort of mysterious obsession with uh, recriminalizing marijuana after again, you know, ten years now, fifteen years now of, of movement in the other direction. It's so far out of step with uh, with, with with where the political process had gotten. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know where, you know, and again, I'm not sure I know for sure what the constituency for that is other than the rally going base. Uh, I'm not even sure it's there. I mean, right, you right. got to think you've got a few people in those crowds who have smoked marijuana. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, kind of seriously, I, I thought I thought the, the governing, well, well, I thought a, a commonly held philosophy in those crowds was like, you know, leave the, keep the government away from us except when absolutely necessary. Like, yeah. I mean, they would. There are things they would like from the government, but they didn't strike. Well, it's hard to say. On the one hand, right, you did right. have the law and order themes right. from from right. Trump. That's true, yeah. but I, you know, y you also heard that. Well, this is meth country, you know, we, right, right. which isn't to say there aren't a lot of people there who would rather it weren't meth country. But right, right, right. so I don't know. I don't know what to think. Well, and there's, and I mean, it was off. It's often talked about, and in, in certainly in Sessions' language and in Trump language of like. They're not talking about math country. They're talking about, they're ta well, they're talking about the tragedy rather than the crime of opioid addiction. Right. And then they're talking about inner cities where you get shot, where you get killed, which, like, is a, is a, is a complete fiction at this point. But if you don't live in those cities, you can create that. It, it's, right. it's not hard to believe that, you know, the, uh, that the New York City of, 2017 is the same as the New York City of 1989, you know, if you want to believe well, that. Well, you just use Chicago as an all-purpose 
you know, right. example, and numbers have gone up there. And so, yeah, I mean, I didn't want to use Chicago. I mean, it's a funny. It's 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 a unlike in the mid '90s. You know, crime was pervasive. It was very common to be a victim of violent crime, even if it was just like a, you know, a, a, a mugging. And that's part of what drove tough on crime politics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now we've moved in a different direction. And for the most part, you know, crime has been, you know, very, very declining in some dramatic ways. And there have been Chicago's an exception and Baltimore's an exception. I think they're the only two. There's a third one um, in the Southwest. I can't remember. You know, there, I think there's only two or three cities where you've really got those jumps. The rest is pretty much on track. New York has been on track. Right. New on track. You know, um, there's a. It, it doesn't take a lot for there to be like a little flare up of 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 of, of, of violence in mm -hmm. poor neighborhoods. But you know, mostly that's that's not been happening. Yeah. Okay, well, any is there anything... Uh, I have a little announcement I'm going to make, but uh, is there anything else on the political analysis front? I mean, I mean, well, yeah, I, yeah. Just a, maybe a word on infrastructure. I mean, the standard thinking had been, well, the way Democrats would have done it is actually have a lot of specific projects. You actually use government money to build, and you actually get jobs, whereas, Repub whereas Trump is uh, under, you know, conservative influence, going to just, like, give tax cuts to companies that claim they're doing things infrastructure right, right. so you, right, so you right. wind up with like private toll roads that only rich people can use or something i yeah. don't know what but what what is your do you have a quick take on infrastructure yeah i mean i think i mean first of all i think it's re, i i don't know how i i think you have to think about congress and how you're going to get this infrastructure package onto the agenda mm -hmm. because democrats can't put it onto the agenda so you have to create something that you know there's either cross-party interest in doing it or Republicans are enthusiastic about it, and that's going to include some kind of tax something. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard Trump say anything that suggests that he understands that, you know, that's basically a bunch of gimmicks. I think I think Bannon, maybe, you know, he, he, he called himself a, a Keynesian nationalist or whatever. I mean, I think he sort of had that basic intuition that, you know, if you don't worry about spending money and you just blast it in, people will be better off, and you'll have you'll you'll have gains. And you, and who cares about the deficit? I mean, which is a perfectly, you know, not a perfectly respectable position if if you if you're serious about it. Um, so without that, and I don't think you have even that basic instinct. And I think yeah, I think it'll be a lot of gimmicks dressed up as public-private partnerships or whatever. Maybe there'd be some specific things. But I don't even know, again, I don't even know, you know, we're not yet even close to the proposal stage. And I'm not willing to take, you know, I'm not willing to take so-called white papers that were issued by the Trump campaign on this or on child care or whatever. I'm not willing to treat those as serious plans. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think those are done. They serve their purpose and they're done. So I think they, I think it's a start over on, it, it, you know, I think they're starting from scratch on infrastructure. And I think it probably will just be taxing. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so I said I had uh, an announcement. It's nothing dramatic, but I and the other fine people who work in Blogging Heads, uh, or the other people who are fine. I didn't mean to imply that I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> I and the other people, comma, who are fine and work in Blogging Heads. Yeah. So uh, you, may or, you may or may not be fine. I may, I'm not saying I'm not fine. Yeah. Well, I want to be totally clear on this. I'll vouch for you. I'll vouch for you. I'm not saying I'm not. I'm going to delay this. I'm going to delay this announcement. Okay. <laughs> uh, decided it might be interesting to try to set up like a virtual meetup featuring me and some number of Blogging Heads viewers and or listeners, uh, possibly including the kinds of people who make comments in the comment section. But in any event, uh, at the risk of straining our technical resources, we are going to try to get like six, seven, eight people. Uh, and have a conversation about, you know, largely about Trump, just because everyone's interested. People have different takes. It's weird. And so and, and we want to just try this. I think the idea is we'll probably post it. But if it just is a complete disaster, maybe not. But it could be it could go public. Uh, whereas with all these conversations, we're committed to making them public. We've right. never like shelved one, no matter how uh, how unfortunately it went. But um but anyway, so really? never, never, no, never. Oh, that's good. It, it's our policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's there was a point where we were forced to decide what our policy was, and we decided. And it's 
it's actually written on the site somewhere. Uh -huh. um, I mean, uh, if if two people, I mean, technical difficulties is one thing. Yeah, but, I've, but, I've, I've had like two or three scraps. Yeah, text. that happens. But if, and I suppose that if both people had the conversation agreed they don't want it up, you know, we would honor that. But right. but even if one of them doesn't want it up, it's like tough luck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> you, so anyway. Uh, this this might wind up being public, but if people are interested in participating, they should send an email to our, our, our contact address, which I think is just contact at bloggingheads.tv, but in any event, it's findable on the Blogging Head site. You might put virtual meetup in the subject heading and just register your interest. Uh, if you want to say why you're interested, feel free to do that, <clears throat> although I suspect we'll just go with a first come, first serve. Uh, criterion, if, assuming there's more than six, seven, or eight uh, interested parties. Anyway, this is a bold experiment. It's this kind of boldness that made us what we are, <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. And uh, so I encourage people who want to have a conversation with me and a number of their fellow listeners slash viewers to uh, email us. Okay. That and like uh, and uh, and that's it. So wh wh where can we find you? Would you want to plug anything? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think the best uh, the best place I haven't I've been uh, I haven't been as productive uh, as I as I usually am. But our 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 blog on the Vox dot com site, which is Vox dot com slash Polyarchy. Polyarchy is the name of the of the blog. My colleague Lee Drutman, me, a bunch of other people uh, here contribute to that to that blog and then I've been a little more active on Twitter as M Schmidt 9 uh, for, for those who, who don't follow. and why they name polyarchy it's uh, it's a it's a title that we've taken from the political scientist Robert Dahl mm. the title of one of his books the idea of a political system that is drawing on a lot of different sources of power simultaneously rather than right it's the opposite of, of uh, you know Whatever we have now. Yeah, I think we, I think we studied a book of his in college called "Who Governs," yeah, that's which was a study of how politics works in New Haven. I guess he was at Yale. Right, and but, I grew up in New, I grew up in New Haven, so okay. I was kind of I read that book when I was like fifteen. And the, and the and the moral of the story right. was yes, it's very pluralistic and fluid. There are a number of sources of influence that come to bear right. on local politics. That's right. They, they cut across each other, and and well, it, it's a great topic for another time. But there were there are definitely things that he missed about. You know that power actually can be quite concentrated, and and what he did really foresee was that power in New Haven was you know was not as open to African Americans as it had into you know Irish and Italian mm -hmm. uh, groups of immigrants. So um, it's a it's an interesting but flawed book. But he also changed his views over time and became you know somewhat less optimistic than he was mm -hmm. in in that early phase. And 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 polyarchy is kind of middle period. That that has happened to many of us, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> less optimistic but we will uh, but we will strive on well <clears throat> thank you so much Mark Schmidt and okay. uh, people can find you where you said they can and then maybe down the road we can do another Trump check-in that'd be great all right take care okay bye-bye bye-bye